Right now, 250 daring men and women are climbing toward the summit of Mount Everest, the highest point on Earth. Some will succeed, most will fail, seven will die. Believe it or not, this picture is taken of my grandmother, who in 1929 was one of the first Western women in the Himalayas. Now, 1929, just think about that. That was around the time when Mallory and Irvine were trying to climb Everest. There were no maps. It was a three-month journey by ship just to get to India. She was working as a nurse for the famous British climber, Sir Hugh Rutledge. When she went back to England um, after her time in the Himalayas, it was such a stigma for a woman to do something like this back then. And my grandfather was so ashamed by what she'd done. He made her throw away her crampons, her ice axe, a snow leopard skin that was given to her as a guest of honor by the villagers. And it remained this dark secret for years. That was until my mom, when I was about 15, discovered the photographs of Granny. And um, I remember looking at these pictures of Granny um, on tiny little wooden pulleys crossing raging rivers, and you know, in clothes like today. And I remember thinking, Granny, you have suddenly become seriously cool. I want to do that. And in my mind, my grandmother is one of the pioneers of adventure travel, something I'm a big advocator of today. Take every opportunity that comes your way. That is literally my mantra. And my Everest opportunity was one of those fly-by-night moments that could have just passed me by. And it literally went like this. My mum and dad were in London at a, a bank function. And dad said to mom, go and speak to that guy over there. He's a climber. Um, so mom goes up to Andronico Luxic from Chile, and she goes, I hear you're a climber. And um, he sort of nods, yes. And she goes, well, my daughter's a really good climber. And take, slightly taken aback, I'd only climbed one mountain at this point, um, he said, well, would she like to join the Chilean tour for Everest expedition? And mom said, oh, she'd love that. And um, so basically, that was um, how my whole Everest thing came about. I took that opportunity. I got on the phone to Andronico looks at from Chile as it's been my dream to climb Everest and he sort of backtracking a bit said well you need to come to Ecuador meet the Chilean team and climb to 20,000 foot peaks in a week so I went from my summer holiday in Saint Tropez where I'd burnt the candle a bit at both ends partying in the day I mean training in the day partying at night and I show up in Ecuador to meet the Chilean team and they're a pretty hardcore bunch of climbers with a sense of K2 without oxygen, um, the north, uh, the Kanchan face of Everest, um, to name you know, just a few things that they had done. Um, unbeknownst to me, they had immediate plans to ditch the gringa. So shortly, um, halfway up the first climb of Chimborazo, I come down with the worst bronchitis. But I knew that if I was gonna get on this Everest trip, I had to climb these two peaks. So I coughed my way to both summits, hiding my antibiotics, and um, I scarred my lungs for life in the process. Those scars still show up on x-rays today, but I got myself on that Everest expedition, and that was all that mattered. I then went on and climbed six more 20,000 foot peak, uh, peaks down in Chile with my Chilean team, and I completely credit them for getting me ready for Everest. Right now. The seven summits, for those of you who might not be aware, are the highest peaks on each continent, located in some of the most remote corners of the Earth. Everest. Hello? Everest. Needs no introduction. The tallest mountain in the world and claims the lives of 10% of those that climb it. This particular photo is taken of my team descending through the Kumbu Icefall, one of the more treacherous areas of the mountain, and where more than half the fatalities have taken place. Elbrus in Russia, at just over 18,000 feet, it's the tallest mountain. Kilimanjaro in Africa, an extinct volcano that rises majestically out of the game plains of Kenya and Tanzania. We went through some bikes, some very diverse scenery from jungle to arid moorland to a melting glacier near its summit. Kosciuszko in Australia. 
Um, the easiest of the seven summits by far, I have an altitude low, lower than Aspen, Colorado. The girls spice things up down under by scaling the Sydney Harbour Bridge. <laughs> Vincent in Antarctica. The most remote of the seven summits and a logistical nightmare to get to. We threw, flew from the southernmost coast of Chile, five hours south, landing on the ice at Patriot Hills. We then got on another plane and flew across the ice cap. Um, and we didn't see that plane again for another two weeks. I didn't really like to think about what might happen if something went wrong down there. I don't know if you've ever seen a plane that lands on the ice, but um, I was a little bit shocked when I saw this plane, <laughs> the size of a 747, um, that took us to the ice. And that's Patriot Hills, and obviously me digging the boys' camp, as usual. Aconcagua, known for its high winds and violent storms. This mountain tested my physical limits to the max and sent me straight to hospital for frostbite. Now you probably think that's a nice summit day, but that um, was a frozen piece of hair going across my face. I was just too tired to move. <laughs> Denali in Alaska. Some say the coldest of the seven summits, and I came away from this mountain learning a very important lesson. When I came out of Everest, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I'd lived on this bed of rocks at, for seven weeks, I'd lived and breathed Everest for seven months. And here I was, I'd done this amazing thing that no one thought that I would do, and I was lost. I was suffering from what's known as post-Everest depression, the removal of a big goal in one's life. So it was immediately after this time, I was down in Thailand recovering from the effects of uh, two months living at altitude, that I saw no woman had climbed the seven summits in under a year. And I knew that this was going to be my next goal, and I set my heart on doing it. By the time I made this decision and got back to England, it was June, late, late June, and I knew because of the different hemispheres, I needed to start climbing by August. That left me six weeks to raise the money. Sponsorship was a nightmare, and I was raising money in a bull market. So I contacted every conceivable company that I thought might want to sponsor an unknown girl wanting to break a record in mountaineering, from airlines and banks and insurance companies and cosmetic companies, you name it, I contacted everybody. I had no shame. And um, Red Bull came back and they said what I was doing was not extreme enough for them to consider sponsoring. <laughs> so feeling, feeling utterly despondent. I got on a plane and I went to New York and here three amazing companies gave me the opportunity of a lifetime. And I will forever be indebted to these companies. I then got on a plane and headed straight out to climb Elbrus in Russia. Um, just look at these pictures, sorry, they should be moving a little faster. Um, Albus and Russia, which is it. Um, so Russia, the hard part about climbing all these mountains, having climbed Everest first, is that everyone thought that they would be easy, completely forgetting that weather dictates the outcome of any climb. Anyway, I got lucky in Albus, quick turnaround, back to London, did my laundry, straight out to Africa to climb Kilimanjaro, another straightforward climb, and then um, out to Asia, I'm just going to be quickly on those ones, because I wanted to get to um, where I learned my most important lesson. Um, we then went to climb Vincent in Antarctica and Aconcagua. I had to reclimb it back to back. Vincent was a huge stress for me because it was costing me more than half my total sponsorship money. I had one shot. You should never climb a mountain feeling like that. Anyway, I got lucky with my summit down in Vincent, and with one <coughs> day's rest, I headed to reclimb Aconcagua. Now, one word of advice. I went to Aconcagua feeling confident. Never go to a mountain feeling confident. <laughs> the mountain has amazing ways of humbling you, as I was to find out. So my plan was that we would ride in by mule, three nine hour hours in the saddle, which my male guides were really unhappy about, and we were going to go base camp, camp one, camp two, summit, out. That was the plan. Completely forgetting that really I'd just come from Antarctica and, um, and we were only climatized to 16,000 feet and now about to go to 23. So we had a few dramas, pack mules fell off the cliff, I was feeling a bit rattled by the time I got to, to, to base camp, my cameraman came down with altitude sickness at camp one. So I went up to camp two, just outside camp two my guy told me that my lips had turned blue and he was turning me around. So the thought of going back, having gone through everything I'd been through to get there, I remember frantically putting on my pink lipstick and sort of just saying, I feel fine. <laughs> um, and I got myself a rest day. 
and then I went for the summit of Aconcagua. Doctors say it takes the human body six months to recover from an Everest climb. So here I was, six months later, on a six different mountain, six different continent, and I raised the money, and I was climbing this mountain too tired, tired, too fast. So I get to the summit of Aconcagua, and I collapse. I paid the price that you should never pay in mountaineering. I had misjudged my physical limits. That is how people die in the mountains. I lay there in this crumbled heap, which seemed like eternity. And it was just myself and Angdorji Sherpa. He couldn't carry me down. He was tired. So, I'm, so I knew for me to say that you have climbed a mountain, you have to climb it up and you have to climb it down using your own power. No one carrying you, no one towing you. That, you don't run a marathon and collapse halfway through and someone carry you to the end and you say you did it. So I lay there. Somehow I managed to get the strength to move down the mountain under my own power. I came away with my life. I was one of the lucky ones. I went straight to hospital in Buenos Aires to be treated for frostbite in my feet and my, and my, and my hands. I then went to, uh, waited three months for the earliest, safest time that I could climb Denali in Alaska. When I got to the summit of Denali, it was one of those moments in life that you look out across those huge majestic mountains and you want to freeze the picture. All the blood, sweat and tears that I had shared the past year was all in, condensed into one intense moment. I was so happy. The goal I'd set myself 360 days earlier had happened. My happiness was short-lived. I woke up the next morning to find the bodies of two neighbouring climbers lying dead next to my camp. I will never forget what their bodies looked like. And I came away from Denali thinking, climbing, like life, is so much about the journey and the experience and the lessons that you learn. And it's not always about getting to the summit. Just in case you underestimate um, the gear required for base camp, this is me. We had four tons of gear at base camp. Uh, hair washing, once every two weeks. I didn't shower for six weeks, the whole time I was on Everest. Um, I had a fundamental issue with the Sherpa's uh, boiling water for me to take a shower, so that was my bath. Um, I had to face my fears every single day on Everest. I am terrified of heights, but I knew that if I was going to climb Everest, I had to do everything within my power to make that happen. And that meant controlling my fear. Mother Nature can take us at any given time on Everest, and she did. Um, so I had to control it, what I was able to control. So I controlled my mind like a vice. No thoughts of big air, falling off cliffs, um, Serax landing on my head were allowed to enter my thoughts. My sole focus was just getting to the other side of the ladder, or to Camp One, or whatever it was that took me to the summit of Mount Everest. And it is true, facing your fears definitely makes you stronger. Here is some footage of me on, on one of the ladders. Shows you how scared I am. Okay. Mount Everest has killed many climbers who are stronger and more experienced than Annabelle. And she knows it. It's like she's trying to run before she can even walk. danger. Well, there's plenty of things that drive you at different times on the mountain. I wanted to make mum and dad proud of me. I wanted to prove to everyone that's, who said that I couldn't, that I could. I wanted to do it for me. But upon closer reflection, there is actually only one answer. And that is, you learn to respect yourself. And with that respect comes a confidence, not an arrogance, a confidence that enables you to go about your daily life and deal with all the obstacles that life throws you away, whether it be getting a divorce or losing your job, or in my case, being a single mother. I know that I will be able to deal with anything that comes my way, because I've been to a much harder place. Here is some footage that I think shows some of the adversity I faced on Everest. I tell myself a lot that I can do this, that other people have done it, and I've definitely got the strength and the ability to do it. Headed toward Camp 3, Every climber on Mount Everest comes face to face with the cold, hard reality of death. 
Annabelle Braun pays respect to the mountain and the fall. Um, I've just seen my first dead body, and I'm not really enjoying that experience. As a matter of fact, I find it really off putting. Come three, could come soon enough in my eyes. I guess I'll keep going. I'm tired. On the icefall's final ladder, Annabelle is clipped in with two safety lines. Still, it doesn't exactly feel safe. It's hard to enjoy yourself in this environment, even when you should feel thrilled. Annabelle's team is in first place, and she is in position to be the first woman to summit this year. But is she happy? Just torture. That's higher than Felix jumped from his balloon. And it was a logistical nightmare. I endured extreme heat, committed to my goal. With determination, focus, ton of luck, and the love and support of my family, I was able to achieve the unimaginable. So there is nothing unimaginable about all of us here, setting our goals high and challenging all our energy into achieving them. So if the girl that's terrified of heights can climb the tallest mountain in the world, just think of what every single one of you can do if you put your mind to it. Here's my summit day footage. And you have one shot. Ultimately, it's your legs that have got to get you up there. It's legs and lungs. That's the two things that take you to the summit. Annabelle Bond has made it to the Hillary step. Here, she must play Russian roulette with the safety lines. If she picks the wrong one, she could die. I can't actually believe that I'm here and I'm just trying not to get too nervous. Annabelle is higher than any other mountain top in the world. To her right, she has an awesome overview of the Himalayas. Straight above her, she has just 60 vertical meters to go until the summit. To her left is a deadly drop off that plummets for more than a kilometer. With their teammates proudly waiting for them, Annabelle and Andromeda take their last few steps to glory. It's been the most bonding thing with the team. I think that's to go through an experience like this together. We've all cried, we've all, you know, laughed. Just being on the top there is something I'll never ever forget. It's the most difficult thing I've ever done in my life. Annabelle is ecstatic, but she's on the most inhospitable piece of land on Earth. Getting up Mount Everest is just half the battle. She still has to get back down, alive. Most people are in shock that I've made it. I don't think people can believe <laughs> that I've actually done it, which is a nice thing. It's it's good to surprise people rather than to have them expect you to do it. Chileans were very excited. <laughs> Thank you very much. 